This highly detailed cutaway painting from around 1690 is attributed to Thomas Phillips, an English military engineer and a fine draftsman. It's notable for the volume of technical detail it contains, all accurately illustrated, providing a great asset for us, helping us better understand the anatomy of a Royal Naval fighting vessel in the latter half of the 17th century. This is a first-rate vessel, the highest classification of six in the Royal Navy's rating system, which was used to categorise warships between the 17th and 19th centuries. It was based on firepower, builder's weight and the size of the crew. This vessel carried over a hundred heavy cannon, weighed around 2,000 tonnes and carried a complement of over 750 ratings, junior and senior officers. Closer examination of the painting shows the exceptional detail, particularly here in the stern. Wooden panelling adorns the cabin walls. There's a selection of small arms and what appears to be a Davies quadrant, an instrument for obtaining solar elevations used in navigation. A wonderfully exotic detail to be found in such a technical painting. The panelled cabins share floor space with huge cannon, lest we forget that this was a ship built for action. Let's take a closer look at one of these. To make one ready for use required a great deal of manpower. An explosive was needed in order to blow the ball from the barrel, but there was much more to it than that. Let's assume the weapon has already been fired and is about to be used for a second time, and examine the sequence of events. A wet swab or sponge is run down the barrel to clean away any powder residue and extinguish anything hot left in the barrel that could reignite the next charge with disastrous consequences. After every fourth firing, a worm was used to ream out the barrel and rid it of any debris that had accumulated. Next, a cylindrical shovel or ladle is used to insert a charge of gunpowder at the base of the chamber. The charge could be loose or in a cloth or parchment cartridge. The latter would require piercing with a pricker prior to ignition. There then follows a wad, a disc of canvas or old rope, rammed home with the rammer, which could share a handle with the ladle. The shot is rolled in, rammed, followed by a second wad. This is used to prevent the ball rolling out if the barrel is depressed. The cannon is then run out into its firing position, the crew heaving on the gun tackles to move the carriage, which could weigh two tons. A heavy rope is wound around the cascabel and secured to the large iron rings set into the bullock. The gun is sighted left or right, elevated or depressed to aim. But imagine if the ship was rolling whilst all of this was going on. Then all is set. With a cartridge, the pricker pierces the charge. The touch hole is filled with priming powder, a more refined blend. The linstock, a smouldering fuse on a long stick, is used for ignition. The priming charge burns down and the cannon fires. Immediate recoil hurls the weapon violently backwards. The breech rope tightens, absorbing the energy, and the monster becomes still. Any rope breaking during this action would have disastrous consequences and this gives rise to our modern phrase, a loose cannon. A ship at sea naturally takes on water in small quantities through leaky joints, bad weather and all kinds of other ingress. Accidents or damage in battle can cause significant flooding in a ship and water has to be removed quickly. This vessel is equipped with a chain pump draining from the bilge, which was capable of discharging up to a tonne of water a minute. Let's remove all the decks and casings and take a look at the mechanism. The crew worked a pair of hand cranks to supply the power. A sprocket wheel engages with a chain, similar to a bicycle but vertical. Every other link has a leather disc attached which makes a seal with the inside of the circular pipe casing. When the chain is set in motion, water is collected from the bilges and carried up the pipe in the closed vertical cylinders. At the top, each column of water is discharged into a sluice on the lower gun deck and sent overboard. The capstan on a ship was a means of increasing the pulling power of the sailors. 
the vertical axle could have two drums, one on each deck, in order to double the number of bars that could be brought to use in its operation. The bars were inserted into slots on each drum to which the sailors would lend their weight, often singing a sea shanty to coordinate their efforts as the capstan was turned. The diameter of the anchor cable was far too large to wrap around the capstan, so a loop of smaller diameter rope was used, called the messenger cable. This would run parallel to the larger cable via a roller near the hawse holes at the bow. As the capstan turned, the messenger cable would be lashed to the anchor cable with loops of rope called nippers, which would pull on the larger cable and drive it sternwards for subsequent stowage below. The nippers would be removed and the anchor cable allowed to descend through the main hatch to the orlop deck. We also see the two large sturdy frames called bits, which were used for securing the cable when the vessel was lying at anchor. Heading along to the bow, we see the cooking stove, complete with a large cauldron. A fire on board a wooden ship is unthinkable. Thus, the stove was built on bricks or slate slabs, usually with a bed of sand beneath to check the transfer of heat. A vertical chimney through the weather deck vented the smoke aloft. This was where the crew's food was cooked. Before the open hearth there was an iron frame to spit roast fowl or a multitude of other victuals. A drip tray for the fat would be placed on the ledge beneath. Whilst the great cauldron creates the image of endless watery stews with few ingredients and little flavour, the truth could be very different. Records show that a great variety of food could be cooked. Open it up and we see that the cauldron would be filled with a variety of fare. For instance, at the base, a joint of meat that requires long cooking, coated in a flour paste and wrapped in cloth, simmering away. Over the meat, wooden slates are placed. On top of these, tightly sealed earthenware jars containing various meats and vegetables for stews, heated gently in the boiling water. Also bags of beans, cereal grain and even suet puddings. Hot water for drinking and domestic tasks is provided by the pipe and tap exiting on the far side of the cauldron. Thanks to the skill of Thomas Phillips and his exceptional eye for detail, we can see this painting with enlightened eyes. And by examining only four of its many features, we can see how ingenuity and a gathering technical confidence was shaping the future of Royal Naval vessels at the end of the 17th century.